before Marcus, that is his son, six year old, went to bed, he came to me and asked, Mom, why can't I be white? This really disturbed the mother. And he, she had consciously named Marcus after Marcus Mosiah Gavi. And for Marcus, being brought up in a home that is South African, a home that breathes and eats and smells and everything African, before going to bed, coming to ask the mother, Mom, why can't I be white? It's a lot of volume. So the question was, what can be done? So I called a meeting and we discussed it within the unit, ethnic minority unit, we discussed it. And we said something had to be done. So what had to be done? We have to, it was imperative that we do something, a manifestation that will uh, shake London and make it reverberate across the, Her Majesty's Kingdom. United Kingdom. So we say that, okay, Africa, Africa, what has Africa contributed to the world? We have to bring it home. We have to bring it home. So we say that we organize activities to celebrate Africa's contribution to world civilization from antiquity to the present. What's also what's important is, I think, is help to understand the context, the social landscape in which we operated during a period of time. As he indicated, Thatcher abolished the GLC, the Greater London Council, and the Labour Party decided that we want to have a continuity of the work of the Greater London Council. And we created a successful authority called the London Strategic Policy Unit. And within that unit were several subunits, what we call groups. And the Race Equality Group was one of those groups of which I was the head. Now we are not, we are not in a sense, uh, assuming sole and individual responsibility for Black History Month because I think one has to understand that within the community within our, our communities right across London or right across the United Kingdom. We were all engaged in all of our activities. For me personally, outside, where, where my, my uh, other act of community activists, I was engaged with the Pan-African Movement, with the Black Liberation Front, with the Grassroots Newspaper, and with Operation Head Start. In all of those organizations, we were engaged in celebrating different events, whether it is African Liberation Day or whether it's Black History Month, which at the time, Black History Month was in February celebrated in the United States. So what we are not claiming is exclusivity in terms of trying to establish a forum called Black History Month uh, exclusively. But within that social context, we felt that we were placed in a position as officers in the local authority with access to quite successful, uh, among, uh, uh, quite a substantial amount of resources. And if, as, 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 as African and Caribbean and, and, and black people, we are in those institutions, we had a particular duty to ensure that the program of those institutions reflected the needs, the demands of all communities. So, as a senior officer within the local government, we contributed to all of these using our status Using, using our position of authority to try and create an institutional, institutionalization of the celebration of Black History Month to create a, a uniqueness of its British context. Between the Labour Party Race Action Group of Keith Vaz, which went way back to the early 1970s, 
And then you have the Black Train Women's Solidarity Movement, the Burning Grant, with Renoir's in, died in 2000, uh, much too early. That was founded in 1981. And then SCACAP, the Standing Conference of Afro Caribbean, uh, uh, Afro Caribbean and Asian Councillors, which was formed in 1982 and chaired by Russell Prophet. So I think that out of those clusters of activity, it's no surprise that as the players in those, the actors in those, to use a science, social scientist term, um, the Labour Party black members, they were African, Caribbean, and, and Asian. And you had this uh, movement of uh, municipal socialism, the Ken Livingston left, if you like. Um, broken away from workerist, class reductionist ideas of the militant tendency that said that as workers we're all equal, we shouldn't see separation of gender and, and race. The, the colorblind approach has been totally discredited. Of course, black people need to self organize, they need to be involved in self determination, as the Garvey movement taught us. So we draw our influence, our inspiration, if you like from the likes of Marcus Garvey, who at one point had six million people in the United Negro Improvement Association in the United States, rocked America to its very core, fearful for black people organized so powerfully together. So that in 1983, a little better Herbert Morrison House, the first black section was actually in um, Westminster North, which we'll know as Paddington. Right? Diane, Diane Abbott's um, uh, base. And uh, so activists came together with people who were already in town halls, like Lorenda, because Lorenda was already a council, so was Bernie Grant, so was Russell Prophet. With activists, hotheads like me. You know, I was a journalist at 10 television in those days, on your telly, four nights a week and an active trade unionist. So, I could spin a story or two as a PR. And I think we all outspun Hattersley and, and Kinnick, didn't we? With all that machine that they had against us, the whole Fleet Street were against us, the Labour Party leadership were against us, the trade union leaderships were against us. It was a real David and Goliath fight. And people didn't give us a cat in hell's chance of ever winning, of ever getting a constitutional change to the Labour Party that would give us our own caucus, and I'll explain one with our self section in a moment, our own caucus within the party to which black people gave almost 90% of their votes, the most loyal constituency of Labour Party supporters. And yet we had no voice, no member of parliament uh, in 1983, no member of parliament of colour. The last Labour Party member of colour, the last member of parliament of colour, as I was quite rightly said, was Shabuji Sakhnawala in Battersea, who was elected in 1922 and defeated in 1929. So that's a long gap, 70 years. And yet this party that was quite happy to take our votes and take us for granted and use us as voting fodder had no incentive to have the black voice heard in the so-called mother of parliaments. So we had to agitate for that. But I have to tell you, that wasn't our only concern. Some people characterise the black section movement as one whose historical highlight was the election of the Black MPs in 1987. We have other monuments. I've talked about Black History Month and the role we play uh, in that. The Black Agenda that came out in 1988, where we put under one color, under two colors rather, uh, a document that had policies on inner cities, women, trade unions, Azania, which you'll know is South Africa, international issues, um, employment, immigration, the most comprehensive black manifesto 
that there's ever been in this country. I'm very proud of that. In fact, I'm as proud, if not more proud, of the black agenda than the election of four black MPs. Because that black agenda is still being implemented today in town halls, in government. 